This Jeep Talk Show flagship episode is brought to you by you, the listener. Without you, we'd have no reason to do the show. So do you have a product to sell? You know, you can advertise it on, uh, or your business on the Jeep Talk Show. Our rates aren't affordable. They're just downright cheap. Reach out to us today and get pricing and availability by going to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact right now to find out how to reach uh, out to us. Uh, your advertising could be on the show as early as next week. Hi, I'm Tony, and welcome to the Jeep Talk Show, where we put the fun in off-road fun, or in, in your case, Chuck, the F-U. Uh, this is the yeah. only show where you can hear the Jeep owners talk about things like mud, rocks, and giant tires, and not get weird looks. So strap in, grab your favorite beverage, and get ready to laugh, learn, and have a damn good time. We guarantee that after listening to us, you will have the sudden urge to go buy a Jeep and hit the trails, at least Jeep parts. You know, if you're not buying a Jeep, you're at least going to be buying some Jeep parts. So don't say we didn't warn you. Yeah. On tonight's episode, the best midsize trucks for 2024. There's a Jeep in there, so that's the reason why we have it on the show. Don't panic. Uh, in our Jeep Gladiator update, uh, Chuck, I'm going to be tapping your brain uh, for uh, about trailers because uh, I have a max tow package on the 2021 Jeep Talk Show Gladiator. But how to tow? I mean, there's people like me that have never towed, never bought a trailer, don't know what the hell they're doing. So we're going to talk to an expert about uh, uh, pulling trailers and uh, vehicles. In our must-have stuff your Jeep, this is kind of tied into that uh, max tow thing. Mopar trailer brake controller. And uh, Chuck, I expect you to help us out as to the reason why we would need anything like a brake controller. And Do all trailers have the ability to run, use brakes? Because I don't think they do. Anyway, uh, I think this is going to be an interesting episode, and uh, as I've already mentioned, Chuck's with us tonight, so uh, let's get started. Are you ready? It's time for the Jeep Talk Show with hosts Tony, Josh, Wendy, and Chuck. And this is Chuck, and I'm going to start Googling what a brake controller is. <laughs> oh no, that's scary. I thought I had an expert here. So uh, if, if you're watching this on YouTube or someplace on social media, watching the video, and that's what I'm talking about when I say watching, uh, Chuck is out there in the sticks in, uh, where, where are you, uh, Hawaii, California? Where, where are you located, uh, Chuck? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. And uh, for some strange yeah. reason, the internet's not very good in Las Vegas, which kind of sounds like a lie. Uh, but his internet isn't yeah. wonderful. It's good for voice, but not video, so we get to see... Uh, several images of Chuck here in the video. I think you'll you'll enjoy them. These are all <laughs> these are all pic pictures that Chuck took. And then I said, "Hey, Chuck, I need something to show in the video." So he sent all these to me. Uh, Chuck, there's one of those pictures. You're, you look like you're drinking uh, cans of beer in most of them. But there's there's one picture where you have uh, a glass full of ice, and uh, I'm thinking that's Coke. It's yeah. either Coke, Tab, Pepsi. What what you got in there? Uh, probably not a normal drink yeah probably uh, <laughs> you're outside probably, yeah. you're standing next to a fire I, you got your cowboy hat on uh and uh, you, I, probably, you, I just thought it was strange because it doesn't look like beer yeah i probably drank all my beer and broke into the liquor cabinet oh and, uh, just okay so all of her stuff it's one of those brown <laughs> adult drinks <laughs> <laughs> yeah what else do you do screw it i don't care <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, speaking about what else can you do, uh, this is, uh, I think this is kind of interesting because there's been several changes uh, in uh, the Stellantis uh, Organization for America. Our most recent one was a friend of the show, Jim Morrison, um, being moved over to a, a different area. The performance parts, I believe, is where he was going to be uh, moved to. And I think it's going to be good for Jim. But we, we would have liked to have seen him uh, take over the, uh, the whole North America uh, operation uh, in a, a higher position uh, uh, from where he was. But anyway, this has to do, uh, this story has to do with Stellantis' new North America boss. And I'm just going to butcher this name, uh, Chuck. Uh, I mean, if you have an idea, you're more than welcome to uh, give it a shot. But Carlos Zalrila, Carlos Z, thank you, uh, of the uh, Automakers yes. Mexican Operation replaces Mark Stewart, whose name I can pronounce, uh, as a Stellantis North America Chief Operating Officer. So he's a coup. Um, Jeep, Dodge, uh, Chrysler, Alfa Romero, Romeo, and uh, Fiat in uh, the U.S. announced the new top man in North America effective February 1st. So it's coming right up. Uh, actually, by the time uh, you're listening to this, it, uh, that has already passed. So Carlos Z will replace Mark Stewart as North America Chief Operating Officer. 
Uh, Z, uh, it kind of sounds like a movie thing where they, they go by their, their initials. <laughs> Z is currently president of Stellantis Mexico, which increased sales, market share, and return on investment in 2023, ending the year with the best profit ever recorded in that market. He joined Stellantis in 2022. My God, this guy had been there for very long, uh, and he's getting promoted. Uh, mm-hmm. He must have some, some uh, trash on somebody up high. Uh, from mm-hmm. General Motors, where he was previously president of GM South America. So uh, I, I don't know, Chuck. I mean, obviously this guy's making some money for Stellantis, so it kind of makes sense why he would be put in a position to to make more money for Stellantis. Uh, I had to look up what the chief operating officer is. Do you know what that is? Because, I, I mean, I, I know it's one of those you know three-letter positions, but I didn't know exactly what a, a, a chief, a COO does. Yeah, they do all the operations. Yeah, yeah that's bet. kind of an important position, isn't it? Yep, yep. And, and when you say they do all the yeah. operations, of course, they're not doing a damn thing. They're just making sure everybody else under them does. No. <laughs> yeah, they're they're just the boss's boss. They're drinking yeah, they're drinking uh, mixed drinks with ice in a glass uh, and taking phone yeah. calls. <laughs> yeah. Not outside it, uh, next to a fire. I promise you that. No, no, yeah. <laughs> they're more of an in type of people. <laughs> yeah, and they're doing 57 meetings a day uh, in, in, all the way up yeah. to midnight. I don't know. I guess it's worth to make the, worth it to make the big bucks. I don't think so. But this really says something about Stellantis. If you're moving that much executive officers uh, that quickly, that's not a good sign. That's what I was not thinking. Good, yeah. Yeah. Something. Something wrong with it. Well, I mean, their sales are down. They're they're having some issues with, uh, you know, selling. I mean, this is one of the reasons why the Gladiators are, are so down in price, because they're having trouble moving them. Gladiators are a wonderful vehicle, and uh, I, I, I don't know why anybody's not buying them. I mean, interest rates are up, so you got to wonder mm-hmm. uh, why, they, why companies make changes like this, um, unless it has to do something with uh, appeasing stockholders. Yeah, it, it follow the money, right? So we'll see what uh, Mr. Carlos will do. I mean, I suspect he I, won't I, do a damn thing. He may get into the position at a good spot where uh, they drop interest rates and people start buying vehicles again. Yeah, I, th- I think going from South America to North America is going to be a huge change. I think the climate is a little bit different. Not like the actual temperature climate, but the uh, economic oh, yeah. climate is a little bit different no. in our uh, side of the hemisphere. So, And I bet we'll, you the customers we'll are even yeah, different. Uh, the customers are probably yeah. are definitely different in, uh, in Mexico and South America uh, type thing than what they are in North America. Yeah. I would think that anyway. I would, I would concur. So, um, uh, in the very demanding North American market, with many obstacles to overcome, <laughs> sales, <laughs> in order to foster performance of the company, Carlos Z is the best leader among our talented pool to replace Mark Stewart uh, and to drive uh, the change in our business model uh, forward uh, to electrification in the region. Stellantis uh, CEO, yeah, uh, Carlos Tavares, Tavares said, in a a statement. Uh, Carlos uh, Z has demonstrated his ability to bring together and unite diverse teams and to deliver uh, the expected results. And, and I mean, that is really the big, the big thing about anybody in this type of position. They do have to be able to bring people together uh, and have them work together, uh, communicate properly and support one another. So uh, I I would say that is a, a big plus that if he's doing that, then it's, He's going to be more of a success, but I still think interest rates and um, people's jobs. I don't know if you if you heard or not. Uh, I think Microsoft is laying off two thousand uh, workers. I may have that number wrong. It may be higher than that, but I think it's two thousand. So there's going to be a lot of people out there that that, that either can't afford to buy uh, a vehicle because of interest rates or can't afford it at all because they don't have a, a job. They don't have a paycheck coming in. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's. That's not good. No, no, no. And actually, I saw a, a, a news story today where the, the federal government wants people to be out of work because uh, if, you don't, uh, if you don't have a job, then you can't buy things, and it slows the economy down, which slows inflation down, uh, and uh, it makes it better, I guess, for the people that have jobs. And that would be a really difficult thing for me to be in the, the government and make kind of those kind of decisions, knowing that there are going to be people struggling uh, to make ends meet, and and actually there may be some some very dire uh, uh, 
uh, uh, consequences for that depression and things that go along with that because you don't have a job and you can't find one. Yeah, I don't really think the government gives a flying F about the normal people, <laughs> guys like you and me, and mm -hmm. probably 98% of our listeners are working class. We get up every day, we go to work, depending on what time of day you get up, it doesn't matter. But a majority, more than 51% of our life is making money to pay the government to make us not make money you know <laughs> i don't think the government gives a fuck <laughs> well Honestly. what do you what do you think yeah. about us doing something as as the american people to point out that you know we've already paid taxes we pay taxes on when we made the money uh we pay taxes in sales we pay uh more taxes here and and we're double triple and quadruple taxed in in some areas and I don't think that's the right way to go. Uh, I, I was surprised to find out. I'm not a big history buff, but I was surprised to find out not too long ago that uh, before like the 1920s or something, there was no federal income tax. Yet the country still existed. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the, the federal taxes are just 100% government thieving. They're stealing yeah, I'm, I'm a business owner. I mean, I think most of the listeners know now that, yes, I, I work, I own a working cattle ranch, but I also do uh, lots of um, red iron building uh, sales and uh, erection for large industrial buildings. So you, you're and saying you get paid for erections? I, but sometimes I can't get it up. Um, <laughs> well, it's the, the weather. The amount of taxes. Yeah. Oh, it's just cold outside. The, the amount of taxes that we pay as an incorporation, it, sometimes I sit back and go, I can sell the company, just liquidate everything and live on the ranch and not pay the government anymore. And there's, there's that part of me that wants to. So absolutely. I wish that us as uh, American people would put our, our differences aside and uh, actually come together because there's more of us than government. And, I know that there's some people going, whoa, you know, be careful what you say on the radio. Mm -hmm. But uh, I 100% do not like how our government is ran. I do not like the fact that we give them our hard-earned money. And then that money just goes overseas to someone's son. And uh, don't like it. Don't like it at all. Don't like the inside trading. Don't like any of that tax bullshit. I just, yeah. I think it's 100% wrong. Yeah, and I don't understand why... Um that uh, I mean, Congress is there to make sure that uh, people that are doing things uh, incorrectly are using uh, their political position to line their pockets. Uh, but I often wonder, well, maybe people in Congress are all doing the same thing. Not all of them, but uh, there seems to be a, the, the good old boy and, and now woman uh, network uh, of this uh, uh, selling of uh, stocks, getting inside information. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's just not, it, I mean... People don't trust our government. I mean, they're not there for I, us. They're there for themselves. I honestly think um, that your public officials, whether they're in the House of Representatives or any kind of Senate or anything, it should be just like um, getting picked to go and sit in uh, in court. You know, whatever the hell that what, – what is that uh, – when you get subpoenaed to to sit and be on the, some panel, it's a, to, a, a jury summons. Yeah, that's that's summons. that's that's been my my thing that I've said is that you political, political office ought to be like getting a jury summons. So you know you don't want it. Right, you get it for two. You, you get it for two years. <laughs> yeah, you're in there for two you years. Don't want to be there. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be there. And then it's going to be guys like you and me, and we're going to go in there and look at these people that are just filthy rich stealing from Americans and go, you're done. Well, Get it's out. so funny how the okay. math just doesn't add up. You know, they make $174,000 a year and they're worth $32 million or $200 million. Right. <laughs> but anyway, you see this a is... Guy like me as, I'm sorry? A guy like me as... If, could you see a guy like me as the House of Representatives, like, speaker or whatever? Oh, I God. get up there. That would be like, so oh, funny. You sons of bitches. They think, get this MF or yeah, done. they think Trump is bad <laughs> about saying hurtful things. <laughs> oh shut up you little wiener sit yeah, down yeah yeah exactly <laughs> give me that gaffle i'm gonna pitch you in the head with it uh yeah. so anyway back to this story i mean but yeah i mean i wasn't trying to go political there but the, that you see a lot of these same political things going on inside of corporations and the bigger the corporations the more you see and uh, you see of this i believe 
So uh, I, I still maintain that I don't think that this individual has the ability to make any changes, uh, significant changes, where it's going to make the interest rates go down or uh, make the, uh, the economy uh, give you a job, so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's, there's not a lot he can do, only work on the stuff that he can do, which is ultimately what we all do, is that we just do the best we can with what we have uh, and, right. uh, and, and you know, cash the paychecks as long as they're coming in. So anyway, don't feel bad for Mark Stewart, uh, who is uh, leaving uh, this position for uh, Carlos Z. Uh, he is going to be uh, moving over as CEO and president of Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. So uh, he's still going to be in the game, but with a, a larger uh, a larger number of vehicles because you know Goodyear's run on anything, not just Jeeps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good for him. All right, so uh, I want to mention this really quick. Uh, this is the I want to talk about the Jeep Talk Show flagship guest host. Uh, we've been doing this for a couple of months now, and uh, you may not have caught it, or maybe you were wondering about it. So I just wanted to to uh, bring it up and uh, discuss. So uh, obviously we got Chuck here today. We've had uh, Josh. We've had Chip. We've had various uh, people that you've heard on the show in the past, whether it be on the roundtable episode or uh, on the he- on the on the show as a guest. But uh, we're changing things up a little bit. Uh, we uh, we were going to. Uh, I mean, we like uh, coming up with new things uh, to improve the show uh, for you, the listener. Uh, the latest change is having guest hosts for our second weekly flagship episode, so the one that comes out on Thursday. Uh, and by the way, a quick rundown on the episodes. Tuesday is our flagship. It's the first show that we, we came up with and did for so many years. So that's why we call it the flagship. We could also call it classic, but I think flagship sounds better. It sounds more impressive to me. So Wednesday is our roundtable episode, which is our, our Zoom meeting and where we have uh, the, the usual suspects, the Zoom people joining in and either talk to a guest uh, that we have or uh, answer a series of uh, Jeep-related questions. And uh, Thursday is our second flagship episode, and that's what we're recording now. Uh, And uh, those come out again on Thursday. And then we end the week with our guest interview, and uh, the guest interview is me and some guests. Now, that that could always change in the future. We'll just have to see how it goes. I don't have to be on the show. We just need somebody that is a a good host that can uh, uh, ask good good questions and uh, entertain you guys. So... You, uh, like I was saying earlier, you may have noticed over the last few months, we've had various co-hosts for the second flagship, uh, uh, Chuck, Josh, uh, Josh was even in here. He had, he found some time where he could be on and, and we'll do that. We'll have Josh on again, uh, Bill chip, uh, and, uh, we'll be having, and we will be having more. So the, uh, you'll get different voices, different opinions and different experiences. Uh, mine will all be the same unless I change my mind on something like maybe I might change my mind going from steel cable to synthetic. Nah, that's not going to happen. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't be dumb. So would you like to be a guest co-host? This is open to anyone. Keep listening and watching for more information on how you can be a guest host for the show. What do you think, Chuck? Good idea, bad idea? And, and, and don't think, don't consider my feelings here. Speak, speak your truth. <laughs> speak my mind. <laughs> I think it's great. I think uh, there's a lot of different subject matter experts and uh, I definitely am not one of them that knows everything about everything. Tony, you do. No, you have to know none everything. of us do. That's why you're the number one guy. And uh, it's wonderful to hear the different uh, different viewpoints. I don't always agree with them. Uh, usually I throw empty beer cans at the uh, the <laughs> truck radio as I drive down the road. But, um, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Good. Glad to hear that. Um, so we're... Uh, so, uh, moving on, uh, now tr- Chuck, I know you're a big truck person, mainly for business. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely a big Jeep person, but, uh, you do like, uh, do you, you do like uh, good trucks. What is it? You have a Dodge Ram for, for work, right? Yeah, we've got a fleet of, uh, Dodges. Uh, they're kind of a, uh, a tried and true motor. You know, the Cummins motor is a great motor. Uh, we don't have anything other than, you know, three quarter ton and larger. Mm-hmm. I think we have two or three three-quarter ton fleets uh, in the fleet mostly one tons and a handful of dualies and stuff but uh i love them they're good trucks so yeah i'm i'm much more of a full-size truck person probably half ton mm-hmm. would be would be my limit but i'm not a, i'm not a, opposed to something larger uh it just has to do with uh, how much it costs and how much it costs to uh, move it around um, I don't know if, uh, I, I know that you had a, a brief flirtation with some gladiators going out and test driving mm. them and stuff. 
But have you Sexy. looked at any other or considered any other the uh, 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 any of the other mid-size pickups? I didn't know there was any. I really I didn't either. I don't shop. The only one. Yeah, I don't shop. <laughs> if it's not a Jeep, what do I care? Uh, and and then I don't think that's yeah. true for all our listeners, and that's one of the reasons why I'm going to be talking to you, uh, talking to you guys uh, uh, now about these mid-size trucks. So best mid-size trucks for 2024. Uh, I have heard of this truck, uh, the Chevrolet Colorado. Have you heard? Have you heard of this one, uh, Chuck? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. There's there's been a lot of talk yep. about it. Uh, I've I was always a Chevrolet guy. I really enjoyed the Chevrolet vehicles, uh, but they just really don't seem to be made as well. Uh, as other vehicles. Uh, that's just kind of my feel on that. Uh, I mean, I have not had a Chevrolet truck since, uh, gosh, I think the last one I had was 83. <laughs> yeah, they've changed a little bit. Oh, yeah. They're, <laughs> and, you know, the square bodies were pretty. These these new things are just butt ugly. Uh, uh, I'm, the I'm square. Yeah, yeah. The, I know things change, and you have to update the styles and stuff, but the, the 2024 uh, Chevrolet Colorado uh, it's, it says, uh, and I don't know that I agree with this, why does it stand out? And these are the things you really want in a, in a, 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 a pickup truck, I think. Good ride, handling, powerful engine. I can go with powerful engine. Uh, strong towing, refined interior. Eh, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> uh, it says it could, the, 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 the reviewer here says it could be better. Only one cab bed combination, four-door short bed. Uh, starting price is thirty-one thousand uh, dollars, which was which is a little less than what I thought these things cost. But maybe I'm just thinking about full-size trucks. Yeah, that's that's not a lot of money. Uh, but it says starts at, and you know how the starts at price is. Uh, it, uh, it, it, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yes. it, it goes up from there. Now I, I have never owned a Toyota. Uh, but the next one on our list is the Toyota Tacoma, which I think everybody uh, everybody has. I guess maybe unless you were an owner and you had a, a, a problem with it, uh, everybody uh, thinks highly of the Toyota uh, trucks. Uh, is that your opinion, uh, Chuck? Yeah, I've owned uh, I've owned a couple of them over my life, and I've blown both of them up, blown both motors. So they can't handle what a guy like me will hand to it, but uh, you can bounce them off trees all day long. They're great. <laughs> so why it stands out, strong power and torque, uh, enormous, enormous configurability, which that must mean aftermarket stuff, uh, loads of mm -hmm. off-road options, quiet, refined ride, manual transmission availability. Uh, could be better. Uh, it says coarse engine, which I don't know what that means unless it's just it, it's not nice and smooth like an electric razor or something. Uh, it is on the expensive side, but I think that goes along with uh, people thinking highly of them to start with. Uh, limited, not as plush as it could be. Uh, manual transmission is clunky. It, it sounds like a truck. <laughs> You know, yeah. all these things sound like a truck. Maybe that's why they're successful. It's, it sounds like some little small little man, little pretentious man, you know. Yeah, like it's, yeah. It's just not It's just not as nice. My cup holder isn't in the right spot. It's not exactly. ergonomically correct. Uh, oh, yeah, shut up. my cup holder is a left-hand thread instead of a right-hand thread. <laughs> yeah. yeah, little And I have to think up. about it every time, every time I go to unscrew my coffee cup out of there. <laughs> <laughs> People are going... They come in. <laughs> they come in threads. You can thread them in there. You know that might be a Jeep Talk Show million dollar idea for the people that uh, the cup you know bounces around, or maybe they get a little too aggressive or something. You could actually screw the coffee cup into the cup holder. Uh, but uh, no, that's yeah. that's not going to happen. Um, so <laughs> it could be a lot of the a lot of calls uh, from people going. I can't get the cup out, and I can't remember which way to turn. It's righty tighty lefty loosey. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. What if I'm in the passenger seat? Yeah, exactly. Is it lefty, tidy, right, Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> well, tight is right, so go with uh, whatever you like. So uh, the the next one on the list, and I don't think these are any, in, in, in any particular order since the, the Gladiator is not, uh, not not on the list yet. Uh, so that's the way I'm going to go that direction on that one. Uh, but uh, they didn't say that it was like, uh, you know, number one through five or number four, five through one mm -hmm. or anything. But the next one on the list is the GMC Cannon. Um, it sounds like a good second amendment, uh, vehicle, <laughs> uh, why it stands out luxurious interior, uh, in Denali. In Denali. Yeah. Denali. Yeah. The top of the line. Yeah. One. Uh. <laughs> Strong powertrain, <laughs> uh, good ride and handling. So it's not pristine ride or, or, you know, like mm -hmm. somebody using the word mauve or something. I mean, uh, mauve doesn't really fit here, but I just remember that as being. The only other color I know the name of besides red, blue, and you know, Bougie. white. 
<laughs> yeah, so it could be better. Uh, no low cost trim, only one cab bed combination. I guess they're wanting like a long bed, short bed uh, type thing, like from the the full size truck. It's that, a mid size truck. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. It's a mid size truck. It's for the guys that live in town that don't need anything big, but they want a pickup. So you buy a little car with the bed on it, like mm -hmm. El Camino. Ah, it. Uh, you remember the El Caminos? Uh, it's a sexy ride. Yeah, my dad wanted yeah. one of, one of those El Caminos, like in the the mid seventies, early to mid seventies. Yeah. And uh, but he finally bought a truck, an actual full size pickup. After I bought my eighty three, he bought an, an eighty four pickup. Uh, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool that uh, he thought highly enough of uh, of what I had selected that he picked something similar. His wasn't four wheel drive, of course, because he didn't need none of that shit. <laughs> but uh, right. that, that was cool that he got that. But yeah, he had always wanted an El Camino because he liked the idea of a car. But he was he was always doing woodworking and uh, working on the house and keeping things going. And just the idea, uh, I think uh, he had a '73 Nova with a hatchback. So he kind of used that mm -hmm. as a pickup because he would, you know, lay the seat down, the back seat down, and then uh, use that area to store stuff. But actually having a, a pickup bed and a car uh, really appealed to him. And the next one would be perfect for it. <laughs> I can't believe this thing is on the list. The, 20, <laughs> the 2024 Honda Ridgeline. I'm not saying it's an ugly vehicle. It's just very unconventional. Wow. Unconventional isn't necessarily bad, but... I'd never buy one. Uh, I laugh at them every time I see it. I, the, the, we, we live close to a uh, college town. And so there's a lot of grandparents that come and hang out to say hi to their grandkids at the college. Mm -hmm. And these ridge lines drive around, you know, and it's like, uh, you're in the wrong state, man. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how, <laughs> what, how what the quality of the Honda ridge line is, but I have owned a Honda way back when. And it was a very nice little car, very tiny, uh, zero to 60 uh, by the time you got to work. And uh, so, so, <laughs> <laughs> so why it stands out, great on-road ride and handling, innovative bed design. And that I think innovative means it's weird because that's what I've always noticed about it. Uh, yeah. Standard all-wheel drive uh, could be better. Controversial design. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're talking about here to, to today. No inexpensive base models. Well, it's because they they can you know, they can sell it for this. Uh, limited off road, uh, yeah, limited off road. Uh, starting price of forty one thousand dollars, and I think I'm skipping on the price on these things. Like the Toyota Tacoma was thirty two, almost thirty three. Uh, the Canon was uh, thirty seven five, and uh, the Honda Ridgeline forty one thousand. So. Uh, definitely price going up, and uh, I still don't think that's uh, up to the. No, it's a that one, the Honda Ridgeline is a little bit more than the the 2024 Jeep Gladiator, and I I mean I, I understand some people are going to want the Ridgeline over a Gladiator, but why? My God, why? It's this, about the same price. So anyway, let's let's talk about the 2024 Jeep Gladiator, the last one on the list. Why it stands out. Now, I love this. Uh, they, they are right on, uh, on target with this. The only truck with removable roof and doors. Rugged mm -hmm. off-road design. Strong towing. Could be better. <laughs> Rugged design means poor on-road performance. <laughs> Pipe my ass. <laughs> only right. one underwhelming engine option. I, the 3.6 is pretty nice. I didn't think I'd like it, but the, it, it will get up. It'll make that uh, Gladiator get up and go, and it's not a light vehicle. And the price on right. it is 40885 or And you could, you could figure 41000 on this. Uh, that's the starting price, sure. of course. And, uh, but, right. uh, yeah. And, and actually, I think they're going, I, I think uh, Larry had found some uh, uh, Rubicon Gladiators. Uh, they may have been... No, they weren't manual transmissions, but uh, Rubicon uh, Gladiators going for um, $39,000, up, upwards of $40,000. So uh, this right. starting price is n not really relevant right now with uh, the, in the inflation, interest rates, and everything that's going on, and uh, Jeep's challenge mm -hmm. uh, to sell these things. So, uh, But the, I, I certainly don't believe the challenge is, it has anything to do with uh, how good they are. It's just it's expensive and it's a mid-sized truck, and there's a limited number of things you can do with a mid-sized truck. I mean, this is one of the reasons why you don't have a mid-sized truck for your business. That's right. 
yeah, for 10 more thousand, I can buy a Dodge three quarter ton long bed. Yeah. And that's going to be able to do a lot more stuff for your day to day. It's going to, it's going to make you money. Right. Yes. Yep. That's why I don't have one personally. They don't make me money. They just cost me. (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you have more than one truck in your business. It's not just the one you drive and and you buy uh, the Dodge Ram full size, uh, pickups, right? Yep. Yep. We've got a couple Fords. I, uh, for, for fun, I bought a, uh, I say for fun. It's it was a half joke. I, I think it's a 22. It might be a 23. I don't know, but uh, I went and bought a Ford, one ton, and didn't click any option. And it actually showed up with manual windows and manual locks. Oh wow! And I gave it to one of the guys, and he looked at me like, "Are you kidding me?" Like that. No one even. Who would have thought, you know, that, so he's always having to <laughs> roll his window down and it was in the forties. Yeah. I think it was like 43,000 and it's a, it's a one ton full size, full wheel drive Ford. <laughs> you you know, what you should do is you need to go someplace, uh, antique shop and, or something and get one of those rotary dial phones and put it in there and say, Hey, I got you hooked up for, uh, 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 on roads, uh, 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 work site, uh, communications. You know, a lot, there's a lot of people that don't know yeah. how a rotary phone rotary, rotary phone works. Uh, we still have one in our house. Do you? That's what's actually wired in. Yeah. Yeah. And when cool. everyone loses power and they start freaking out, we can just keep calling. It don't matter. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gladiator. My name is Gladiator. Gladiators. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Well, we'll see if we're entertained here me. shortly. So uh, the uh, the 2021 Jeep Talk Show Gladiator is uh, equipped with the Max Tow package. Uh, and that is 7,650 pounds. And that is 6,650 pounds compared to the 4,000 pounds of towing goodness in manual or 4,500 pounds in automatic. Max Tow comes in automatic transmission only. So if you want the Max mm-hmm. Tow package, at least this is the way it was in 2021, and I suspect it still is, uh, you're going to have to have an automatic transmission. But I think the Max Tow package is, is the way to go. So, uh, mm-hmm. and you may wonder, you know, Tony, you don't tow nothing, and we're going to be talking about this with uh, somebody that does tow stuff. Uh, I don't tow nothing, uh, so why did they get a Max Tow package? Well, These are the reasons why I think it's nice to have the ability to tow things because you never know. You might want to do that. Uh, But uh, the main reasons I got the Max Tow Package is it comes with Rubicon axles. So you get the thicker tubes, you get the the wider, uh, the the longer axle, and it's exactly the same thing. It comes on a Rubicon. Uh, It just doesn't have lockers in it. Uh, and uh, it has limited slip in the rear, which I think has helped me off-road on a, a few occasions because I would just go up something lickety-split where the, the gladiator in front of me or behind me was having uh, difficulty. Uh, and uh, I could get 410 gears in it, uh, which I which was a big thing for me because uh, that's a very mm-hmm. expensive thing to do, and then you have to also trust the shop that's doing it to be able to do it, that d- does it right, uh, and the, the, you know, the gears that are being put in there because... I mean, I would normally go with Yukon, but Yukon's had some issues here over the, the, the recent years mm. uh, due to some uh, merger sales or something, I believe is what the, the, the uh, scuttlebutt that I've heard. So anyway, uh, you also get a bigger alternator, uh, and those were the main attractions for me to get it. And uh, also, too, uh, I just like the idea of, of actually being able to tow. And the, the towing, now, I, I don't know, this is probably nothing compared to your Dodge Ram, the 7,600 pounds. Oh, yeah, no. Uh-uh. No, we, we laugh all the time. I, I actually got weighed in at the scale, uh, pushing almost 40. I think I was 39,000 in the, in the Dodge the other day when I was towing some hay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit more. Do you? It's <laughs> a lot of weight. Uh, and maybe you can't do this, but do you ever wait for the, the hay to dry out a little bit so it's not as heavy? Uh, so when I haul it to my place... Uh, yep, it's always dry, but a lot of clients, they wait until it's rainy and shitty and they're like, Oh my God, I need a bunch of hay. So they buy <laughs> a, a lot of snow and they buy a lot of rain. Yep. <laughs> well, you, and it just makes me more money. I don't care. Yeah. And you sell it by the pound, obviously. Yeah. We sell it by the ton. Yep. You bet. Jeez. So, uh, that's pretty cool. So the, the, is there anything, well, I don't know. It's, I think you've probably been towing, uh, as long as you've been jeeping. 
Is there anything that stands <laughs> out in your head about the thing that most people don't understand about towing something? What, what's 100%. 100%. Everybody's focus is on the weight the vehicle can pull. That is not your focus. The focus is the weight that the vehicle can stop. <laughs> your brakes mean way more than your transmission's ability to get it going because you can put a gooseneck ball on the top of a VW bug and you can get that 30,000 pound trailer to start moving with the VW. You can. It's just going to take you a very long time. The second that you put the brakes on that little car, that trailer's going to jackknife around it and kill everyone in sight. So it's always the brakes that matter. The brakes on the trailer and the brakes on the vehicle, how they work together, what percentage of braking happens. And that's why you have a little controller and you can change it all. That is the number one thing is stopping ability. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like whenever you, so, when you build a hot rod, you, you think about uh, what, what do I need to do to make it go as fast as it possibly can go and, and get to that speed quickly. Uh, and then the mm -hmm. then the afterthought, I, I th probably after test driving uh, and having some fun on a weekend, is uh, gee, I need to upgrade mm -hmm. these brakes. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. You, brakes are are the. I, I hear a lot of people talk about uh, towing capacity, this, that, and the other, and it's always, you know, how big are your rotors? You know, because you got Rubicon axles, you got wider axles, you got four ten gears. You know, you're going to have bigger brakes on this than, you know, say a, a, a Scrambler or even a, a, a TJ or a YJ or whatever. Mm -hmm. It all matters that you, you can actually stop that weight. You have to. Um, yeah. So uh, do you get uh, do you get brake fade? I would imagine you do get brake fade on depending on the size load that you're pulling. Um, what do you mean by brake fade? So Help as you're out. as you're using the brakes to stop the you and the load, uh, the brakes uh, the pads will heat up, the the rotors will heat up, and then oh the, my god, and then the brake fade is your inability to stop. Getting back to that that thing about stopping, yes. <laughs> once you get it going. So, <laughs> so the 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 number one reason that we went with Dodges is, is uh, my personal vehicle is a '96 Ford F350. It's a dually. A uh, single cab with a longer 12-foot uh, bed on it. Beautiful, beautiful truck. Um, it has drums in the back because it's a 96 with little baby um, uh, rotors up front. And I was pulling. I was doing some steel work where we used to do I don't know, metal work and, and things like that. And I went to stop. And it pushed me right through a red light. And it's a it's a manual transmission with a gear splitter in it. So I'm grabbing gears, and that truck just, nope. It just didn't have the braking ability. And I ended up stopping in the middle of the intersection right as a grandma and a little, you know, Honda, you know, Corolla drove by or whatever. Oh, I'd say Ridgeline, and, uh, Honda Ridgeline. <laughs> yeah, Honda Ridgeline <laughs> drove by. Like, I almost, I almost T-boned her. And I it was me... I think one of my sons and a good friend of mine that went up to weld for this ranch up north, and uh, it shook me up. It shook me up a lot. And I realized, because I'd been towing for a long time, but I finally started pulling lots and lots of heavy weight. Like my smallest piece of equipment is, you know, 14,000 pounds. And I started reading up on what actually can these things stop. And, uh, I think that was on a Friday or Saturday or some damn thing. And the next day, we went and bought my first uh, brand new Dodge. My wife said, um, "We're not going to kill people," mm -hmm. you know. And, and she knows I'm a I'm an I'm an antique car guy, so I love my uh, my '96 Ford. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a 10 out of 10 truck. It's just absolutely gorgeous. At uh, it's not practical because it can't stop. So that's that's why we we changed. It's. Um, it's an under underthought on anyone that's getting new into into towing. You just don't think about that. You think, oh, how much horsepower do I have? Oh, how much you look torque? at it. You look, this is a dually. This is a three fifty. Yada yada yada. This is you. And then is there any is there any information that you can get uh, other than just asking people or going to Google? I mean, can you do they have this information at the the dealerships about stopping power? 
Uh, not really, because all the sales guys, they all say, oh, it has this much torque and this much horsepower. Right. And it's got this many gears. And and you go, OK, yeah, but what's your 60 miles an hour? <laughs> how do, at, yeah, how do I you know, stop they, it? They say you can, <laughs> yeah, you can, you know, all my Dodges, you can tow 40,000 pounds. And I go, OK, is that just the trailer weight or is that the trailer and the truck weight? And they just look at you and blink because a lot of times they think, oh, I can pull 40,000 pounds. No, you can't. You can pull 40,000 pounds with the weight of the truck included. And people right now are going, no, that's not true. Bullshit. That's true. Because I have grenaded, well, my current truck, I blew the, I broke the front axle towing. Two other trucks, I blew transmissions up. Because, and I went back to Dodge and I said, hey, that sales guy right there said I can tow 40,000 pounds. Here's my scale tickets at, you know, 40 to 41, 39. And they look at me and they go, you're you're th that's crazy. I go, well, that's <laughs> what you said I can do. <laughs> but you and said, like, and, <laughs> but you said, and that's why now my wife, because we've, we've outgrown the, the, the brand new Dodge Dooley's. That's why we have a Peterbilt and a 53 footer. And I've, I, uh, now I'm what 85,000, 85, five is my max weight that I can do. And I touch that all the time. I come out of the scales one time at 93,000 pounds or 94, and it's like, oh shit, that's that's too much because the truck can't stop it. Right, and and I, even I, a, I remember us talking. Big boy truck. Yeah, I remember us talking about that Ford three hundred and fifty and how much you love that uh, that vehicle. Uh, and I think you still have it, and that, that, that I think that goes back to you loving it so much. Uh, mm -hmm. There was nothing, and I'm sure I asked this, but I don't remember the answer. Uh, there's nothing you can do to it to uh, to increase the braking ca uh, capabilities of it so that you could use it no. again. And and I think the answer is yes, no. it is. But the cost involved was like um, not worth it. Right. It, it's like hey, you know my 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 jeeps that I have that are all you know older than 1981. Can you run 40 inch tires? But yeah, but that would mean I just put a body on a whole different frame. Mm -hmm. You know that's it's not that's not practical. And with this truck, you know, my, my, uh, my Ford, it's just not practical. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's a cabin chassis, so it's a, it's not even a full width dually. It's a three quarter width dually. So I can have a, a, a narrower bed and it just has giant drum brakes to try to switch those over to a, a disc brake. You're just yanking the axle out and putting a whole oh, different axle. That's in. interesting. Well, I didn't realize they still did drum brakes. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, it's 1996. I mean, it's a, it's an old truck. Uh, I misunderstood. It only has 100, miles yeah, I misunderstood. The disc brakes is, what, is on the older one. I got you. So yeah, well, so it's got the front disc and rear drum. But anyhow, it doesn't matter. It stopping is the is the number one, and sometimes you just can't can't get that with older technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, your Dodge Ram that you you tow with now, or whatever it is that you use to tow with, other than the Peterbilt. Uh, what is the the recommended towing capacity of it? I don't even ask anymore because <laughs> it doesn't I matter. So is it just you just take it, it out and find out? Is that how you how you come up with uh, knowing what 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 it can do? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, I I when I grenaded, I think it was a nineteen or twenty. I grenaded seventh and eighth gear on the uh, on the interstate. And we just uh, grabbed another truck and a trailer and put it up on the trailer, drove it to Dodge. I literally went up there and pushed the bumper and just kicked it off the trailer, told them they can have it, grabbed another. It was um, a cabin chassis, so instead of a, a box bed, which is the molded style bed, I just got a, a flat bed straight from the, uh, straight from the dealership. Mm -hmm. And I drove it right out. It's, it's um, a big ranch that's right next to us. They got about 18,000 acres, and I was doing a lot of steel work. And it had, by the time I got there, 30 or 40 miles, went down through the pinch belly in the Wally, which is, that's the name of the pastures, hooked onto a 40-foot gooseneck and drug it out and had to put it in four low to get it out of the pasture and across the creeks and the rivers and stuff. And everyone's laughing going, that truck's got 40,000 miles on it and you're maxing it out. Like, yep. It's a tool. My trucks are, are tools like a right. hammer or a screwdriver. It's just... That's they have to make their money, and if they don't make their money, we kick them off and we get another one. Sure, sure. So don't, I don't care. We just just do it. And like when we were building the cabin on one of my pastures, I had a you know little thirty five foot gooseneck with all the framing material on it, and going across one of the creeks that we own, 
I mean, I snapped that front axle bigger than shit because you're in four wheel drive and you're towing and, you know, you've got this anchor behind you that might be 20,000, 30,000 pounds by itself and you're going across these creeks. So you're four wheeling and towing and you just snap shit and you, you, you bring it back to them and go, hey, either fix it or give me another truck. I don't care. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. assuming that most people with a, a, a Gladiator, even with the max tow package, they're probably not uh, trying to tow 40,000 pounds worth of hay. No. Uh, but no. but a, a, maybe a trailer to, to take a, a, a built-up Jeep or uh, maybe a trailer to go get things that you need to uh, bring back to your mm -hmm. uh, business or your house, probably your house. Uh, and uh, this this thing that says seven thousand six hundred and fifty, I think I heard something that uh, that seven thousand six hundred and fifty, you should add in the weight of the the gladiator as far as what you're what you're towing. So that is, um, I, I'd have to find out where you got that number from. Sometimes, like in the uh, in the Dodge world, they'll say, "Hey, this truck can pull forty thousand pounds." That's not true. It's forty thousand minus the the weight. So if this number is truly just your actual tongue weight of your of your you know the the trailer or not tongue weight but just the weight of the trailer, right? I mean that's that's not a lot of weight still, you know, because you have to add in the weight of the trailer. And if you get to a trailer that actually has brakes, the trailer itself is going to be, you know, twenty five hundred pounds. So then that gives you only five thousand pounds that you can put on it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's not a lot of newer Jeeps that even come anywhere near a 5,000. Yeah, um, I think John, you know, I think John Lee mentions uh, that his, his uh, JKU uh, it weighs in at, at a little uh, over 6,000 pounds. So uh, this is, right. uh, this is a critical bit of information to make sure that you, you uh, factor in the trailer, uh, the, the weight of the trailer adds uh, or takes away from that 7,650 pounds for the max tow. So uh, if you're, right. if you're getting a gladiator to, to tow your built Jeep, uh, you really need to start thinking about uh, with the not only the weight of the trailer but also the weight of the Jeep. Would uh, buying aluminum trailer mm -hmm. uh, help you with that? One hundred percent. Yeah, the the lighter that you can get your trailer, the the better. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we were. Uh, I was really considering getting an aluminum trailer, but they are more than twice uh, what a just a steel trailer is. Um, I know when I I had to buy a brand new fifty three footer. Uh, step deck for the Peterbilt because the the one I had previous I ripped the axles right out from underneath it and that was a scary deal but because um, we were overweighting you know had too much weight on the trailer and just just ripped it apart and uh, they're significantly lighter which means that your load can be more because the trailer in and of itself is lighter it still has the same brakes still has the same axles it's just lighter material so that's anybody that's going to be towing with uh, with a Gladiator pay up for the aluminum trailer and then you're going to be able to get yourself into uh, where you can actually tow your 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 you know air quotes wheeling rig mm -hmm. a little bit better um, so uh, is there a downside to the aluminum other than the cost is it is it not as strong or does it not uh, oh, last it, as long etc cetera, etc cetera? Uh, I have found that they last longer uh, you don't have any rust issues um, uh, they're lighter I think they they look better. Uh, even, even a, uh, aluminum trailer that's been out in the sun and it's all oxidated looks a hell of a lot better than a metal trailer that's all rusty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, when, and if I ever get, uh, the ability to have a nice gladiator towing the scrambler, cause that's, oh, that would be so that's cool. kind of the goal. Yeah. That's the goal. Um, it's going to be an aluminum. Yep. I love aluminum trailers. But but you think enough of the Gladiator as a towing vehicle that you would consider getting one and, and using it to, to tow something like something small, obviously. Not, 100%. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, 100 So on the, the trailer itself, I know that some of the trailers have one axle. Sometimes they have two. Hell, they may have more than that that I'm not aware of. Uh, the, the, mm -hmm. would, the, would the two axle be more, uh, would be better for... Uh, distributing the weight load, uh, but it would, it would also take away from the amount, uh, the payload that you could carry because of the weight of the, the axle or whatever uh, is set up on the uh, on the trailer for those wheels. That actually grows it exponentially. So that's what's called a tandem. Mm -hmm. um, that's a tandem axle. They actually have th uh, three axles. And then they have a tandem dually axle as well. It's nothing. Tandem duallys, you're getting into more of equipment stuff. Uh, car trailers, definitely a tandem uh, usually you can get dual 5,000 
pound uh, axles. Uh, I have one of my gooseneck that has dual 7,500 pound axles. That's a 14,000 pound trailer, which is great. Um, little bumper pull, uh, aluminum. If you get a twin, you know, a, a tandem 5,000 uh, axle, that gives you a capacity on that trailer of 10,000 pounds. But that trailer probably only weighs, you know, 1,800 to 2,000, which means you can put an 8,000 pound vehicle on it. Now, that's way more than the 7,650 pound, you know, 7,600 pound that um, your Gladiator can do. But you don't have to max it out. It's like buying a winch. You know, if, you're, if your Jeep weighs, you know, 5,000 pounds, you want a 10,000 pound winch, right. right? You want to double it. So if you have a, have a Jeep that weighs 5,000 pounds, you're going to want a 8,000 pound trailer or, or whatever, because you, you don't want to max, max it out. You'll get, you'll get some funky things going when you're, when you're, um, going down the road and you don't, you don't want that. Right. You don't have to use it all unless you're me. And then you use it all times two, but <laughs> cheap. Well, you know what you can get away from. <laughs> now, not all trailers have yeah. uh, brakes built into them. Is this correct? Correct. Yeah, there's a GVW. Um, I think it's 5,000 pound. And um, if if the listener knows what that number is, I think it's by the manufacturer or the, uh, like, Dexter Axles, I think, is uh, 5,000 pound. Um, that's, the, that's the cutoff where you can start getting uh, brakes on one axle out of the two or both of them. Uh, I would always recommend getting um, both tandem axles with brakes on them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Because that's that's what you want. You want to you want that trailer to stop itself. You don't you don't want your tow rig to stop the trailer. Because what'll happen is like if as you go downhill, say you're 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 coming down from you know in like in my past that I'd come down from the Rubicon down 50 and that's that's some serious grades. If I didn't have trailer brakes and all I did was I put the brakes on the truck, that trailer is going to try to whip past me. It's going to try to jackknife around me oh, because a trailer's not trying to stop. So like in snowy and icy conditions, like right now here in Kansas, you know, we use the, the trailer brake control that's on the dash, or maybe it's an added thing. It's a little box that's underneath the dash and you really, you apply. Hang on a second. You're chopping. Trailer first. Oh. Hang on just a second. Your uh, your connection's bad. Dang it. That's all right. It happens. Give me a little chatter and see if it's uh, if it's cleaned up. Yeah, ho hopefully it is. Yeah, it's I'm usually getting into some important stuff. Yeah, it's usually momentarily. Uh, so anyway, I think the last thing I got was uh, about uh, the, the icy type stuff uh, was the last thing you said that I heard. Trailer wants to come around you, and then if you're on icy type things. Mm -hmm. So just take a pause and start with wherever you want to start, and I'll clean it up uh, in post. Yeah, like what we had here you know, in Kansas right now where it's an icy condition, you're going to want to reach down and grab – that uh, that brake controller put the electricity to the magnets of the brakes because that's how they work on a trailer and your trailer actually starts braking and stopping the vehicle that's towing it then you apply the brakes to that because oh, if, that if you don't yeah what what'll happen is if if all you do is put brakes to the to the vehicle and not to the trailer and you're going downhill that trailer's just going to want to jackknife on you it's going to want to go around you mm -hmm. so it's very important to have to have brakes on the trailer I believe. Now, there are some really small you know, utility trailers that have, you know, a thousand pound little, you know, go kart axle underneath it. Well, that that's a whole different ball of wax. It's like pulling a freaking wheelbarrow. You're not you're not putting anything on it that that's worth anything. Right. But uh, when you start getting into car haulers and things like that, it it matters. Yeah. Anything with some uh, substantial weight to it. Well, I have about 15 more questions mm -hmm. to ask you, but we're running out of time, so We'll have to save that for a, a mm -hmm. future episode. But I knew that you'd be able to, to answer a lot of these questions. Uh, and th and mm -hmm. that was one of the ones I wanted to get into is if there's a small enough trailer or maybe one of those teardrop trailers that you, you don't have to worry about that uh, for. But it sounds like to me that if you can get uh, trailer brakes, it's always a good thing. 
that anything mm-hmm. that uh, helps you keep that uh, that trailer uh, from uh, just freewheeling and going off on its own is is better. It's it's going to be better overall. So very good, very good. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah. From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G. And you guys talked about uh, your Jeep has a soul, and the uh, EV cars really don't. And uh, yeah, my XJ has a soul, and it even talks to me. And when I turn the key, it goes, I really, I really, I really, I really, I really don't want to start today. And then sometimes it goes, I really, I really, I really, I really, okay, let's go. Well, that's not why I'm calling. <laughs> I'm calling to tell you that everyone laughed when I said I wanted to be a comedian. Yeah, and no one's laughing now, though. <laughs> I don't think that joke worked out the way I wanted it to, but I'm going to run with it. All right, boys and girls, I'll chat to you later, and have a good one. Bye. <laughs> it's. I think what's funny is not necessarily the jokes, but the confidence in which he tells the joke. Like, this is going to be good. <laughs> Hey, coming up on our next Glasses interview hard. episode, uh, we have them every Friday, and actually this is uh, going to be for tomorrow. Uh, I, we're going to be interviewing uh, Dean Shirley of East Coast Overland Adventures. He is a well-known figure in the Jeep community and also a podcaster. You'll hear more about that uh, in the interview. All right, let's get into our must-have stuff for your Jeep. Uh, and, of course, it's tied into the uh, the Gladiator segment, uh, the Trailer Brake Controller uh, for the one from Mopar, I, I, don't know, I was just looking, you know, because I'd bought a tow package Gladiator and uh, I was l- trying to learn a little bit more. And I saw on YouTube where you could uh, install a, uh, a brake controller. And, uh, and Chuck, I'm hoping you can help me out on this thing, too, because I don't understand nothing mm-hmm. about this other than it just activates the brakes uh, on the trailer. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't know how it knows how much brake to apply. And that's the thing that confuses me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I really like this one. I mean, I don't like that it, you were, it, you lose the cigarette lighter or the 12 volt uh, plug uh, on your on your Gladiator's dash. And it's not just for the Gladiator; you can put this on a, a JL JLU as well. Um, but uh, I do like the idea of it's uh, like a, a factory type installation, and you can bring you can get 12 volts uh, out of there from other places. Uh, but uh, so this this thing mounts where the the little. Uh, uh, standard uh, 12 volt plug-in is like like the cigarette lighter on the old vehicles, the big round uh, hole that's there, and uh, it's just, it's a knob and it's got numbers on it, and uh, yeah, it says it's a proportional trailer brake controller for automatic or manual tra- uh, trailer brake activation, which I think you have to have based on what you were just talking about, Chuck. Is you you need to have the ability to to manually ap- apply those brakes on the trailer. You do. Yep. So uh, I, I don't know that you know anything about this specific controller, but I get the feeling that they're kind of all similar. Uh, w- they're all similar. What, what are the numbers on there for? Because this looks like it's a, a big knob that you adjust, and I don't know what that means other than different setting up different levels of, of braking. Uh, it, it's actually the amount of – the 1 through 10 is going to be like the amount of voltage that you're applying to the brake itself. That makes sense. So there's multiple different kind of trailer brakes. You have air brakes, which are like big, big rigs, like my dump truck, Peterbilt, things like that. You have hydraulic brakes, which is more of uh, equipment. And then you have what's called electric brakes. Most of every listener is going to have electric brakes on whatever trailer that they're pulling. It's smaller bumper pull type, type trailers. Those brakes are actuated by a magnet. That magnet is held back by electricity. And the more electricity that you bypass or give it, give it to it, depending on if it's a Dexter axle or a different style of axle, that magnet will either push or pull on your brakes, and that will then contract you know, the, the braking system of the, of the trailer itself. Mm-hmm. So what that is is you – adjust it depending on the amount of weight that you have on your trailer. Uh, So if you have a trailer that's empty and you have this thing, we'll just say 10 is the max number. And I don't know what the max number is on this one. And that's just a, a, any, just one through 10 and you hit that thing, it'll lock your tires right up and you'll slide across the road. And the opposite is also true. Maybe you have 
uh, a big Dodge truck that you're towing with your YJ, which, uh, you know, you see this in the backwoods of America. And you have this 10,000 pound truck on a little trailer and you only have it set to two and you hit your brakes. You don't have enough braking. You're not going to do anything until you increase that amount of voltage and that'll that'll clamp down on your brakes more. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. And when you say you're going to mm. slide across the road if you've got it set to 10, th this only actuates the brakes on the trailer, not on your vehicle. Correct. Okay, good. Correct. Now, now it's also integrated in with the pedal on the floor. So as you push the pedal down, like in, in any of the new trucks, on the dash, it'll actually run from zero up to wherever you have it set at. So if you have it set at 5.3 and you slam on the brakes of the truck, you're going to watch it go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, all the way up to 5.3 and then it'll stop. And all you have to do is push the plus button or turn this knob in, in this situation and that'll increase your braking. So if you want the trailer to brake more than the truck, you increase the da you know, the dial, and as you put the brake down on your vehicle, on your Gladiator, your Jeep, or whatever, it'll put more electricity to the back, and you'll have that 60% you know, braking of the trailer and 40% braking of, of the vehicle that's towing it, depending on how you turn this knob. So the, the trailer brake controller will literally be able to tell how much uh, force you're putting on, the, on your, the, the brake, the, the, your vehicle brake pedal. So it's it's not an all yep. or nothing type thing, which which sounds like it would have to do that. Correct. So that's interesting. So they must have uh, uh, the, the Gladiator set up and other vehicles set up so that it can send uh, not just uh, the brake is on and off type situation, but how much braking you're applying, which sounds like you would have to do to be able to properly stop a, a trailer because uh, all or nothing would be would be be fun, be noisy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. that's really and, cool. Uh, and and then what this this controller does is it, uh, it it tells you it tells the trailer brakes how much to apply and it really depends on what your load is. And that's why you were talking about 100%. how much weight are you pulling. So it's this, it's kind of a a learned mm -hmm. type thing uh doing and figuring out as you go. And I would assume that if you're if you're braking and you go, "Oh, this thing this isn't stopping the way I want it to," then you can turn that knob up and get it mm -hmm. to where you want it. Yeah, and you're going to be able to feel it. Right. So anybody that's been towing for a very long time, you know what they're going to do is even when it's empty, they're going to they're going to leave their driveway and start driving down the road and start applying the brakes as they're just going down the road. They're just going to kind of feel it, and then they're going to adjust that thing because you want it like somebody's pulling behind you. You know, they, they you want that feel. If you just apply the brakes and it feels like nothing's stopping the vehicle. Then, then you're proportioned wrong. You you need to add some more to the back. It, it it's it's a feel thing, mm -hmm. and you just you just adjust it. And it's intuitive. Uh, you, you just this doesn't feel right. Oh, this feels good. You can apply too much brake right. uh, though to it, right? Uh, as well, right? And then mess up the the brakes oh. in the back. Oh, you'll just burn through them. Yeah. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Like uh, when I I, because I'm my brain just goes all the time. Right. So when I'm in my work truck, I'm, I'm usually on the phone or, or doing something. And, and like, I have to bring one of my RV trailers down to, uh, down to Kansas city for a big project that we're doing. I have to tell myself to adjust the brakes because if I get in and just start going down the road and I tap the brakes, that trailer is going to stop me instantaneously. And it, it, it feels weird. Like your face is going to go through the windshield. You're like, Oh shit. You, <laughs> I forgot to you have to go that, and like, yeah, <laughs> yeah this, this trailer is a, you know, a 2.3 where one of my goosenecks might be at a, you know, 7.8, you know, or whatever. And I, I never really get too involved in exactly where it is. I'm just kind of a touchy feely type of guy. But yeah, I, I forget all the time and, you know, get my face slammed through the windshield. Like, Oh, <laughs> whoops. Well, that's, <laughs> whoops that's, ago. that's just good breaks there. That sounds good. So, yeah. right. But you don't buy none of that cheap, uh, cheap shit anyway. So that's why. Nah, you ain't got the money. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, check out this trailer brake controller. It's a Mopar. And uh, we even have the specific Mopar part number here in the show notes for episode 976. Uh, I didn't mention the price. It's Mopar. So the price is going to be a little higher. Uh, $292.33. You may be able to find it cheaper, maybe even on uh, on eBay. Um, do you, do you use any red arc, 
uh, brake controllers, uh, Chuck? Because I know uh, Red Arc will make uh, make some that are actually significantly cheaper than this. Uh, I do not. Nope. Do, are all yours built in, or do you have to add them? No, I, I buy them all built in. Yeah, that's that's the nice way of doing it. Uh, and I would assume the, mm -hmm. the hookup is real simple. You just hook it up to the trailer in the back, and it's all, since it's... Uh, uh, not not all, all of yours, but the ones we're talking about are all uh, magnets and uh, voltage based. So it's just wiring that mm -hmm. you have to hook up. So it's not like airlines or uh, any of that uh, any of that mess. Yep. Very right. very cool. So uh, just go to the again. Just go to show notes for episode uh, nine seven six jeeptalkshow dot com, and you will see a link so that you can go straight to this uh, brake controller. And it sounds like to me, based on what we've talked about uh, tonight, that. Uh, Having a brake controller and a trailer with brakes of any size is a, a good idea. Uh, it may be getting mm -hmm. a little ridiculous if it's a tiny a tiny trailer, uh, but uh, uh, it, let me ask you this real quick: If the uh, I don't know if they're all set up this way or any of them are set up this way, but say your trailer got away from you, uh, or maybe it just got off the the hitch and the chains were still hooked up, is there a, a braking system that if that uh, that brake, that uh, connection goes away on the brake, that it automatically slows itself down and stops? All trailers with brakes have a breakaway switch. Okay, good. So it's going to be, yeah, you'll have little chains, you know, little safety chains that everyone, you know, hooks up incorrectly. <laughs> and then there's going to be a little, like, a coily wire thingy that on the uh, the tongue of your trailer has a plastic quick disconnect. And if you pull that out, um, it loses the voltage to the brakes and the magnets automatically pull and, and hold your brakes. Yeah, so it's uh, when it jettisons off the back of your Gladiator, it doesn't dukes a hazard off the side of the interstate. <laughs> It'll just slide to a, a halt. Yeah. Yeah, if, if uh, installed correctly. <laughs> so if, if your trailer comes off and you don't have a braking system and it runs into you causing the accident, uh, whose uh, who's insurance pays? <laughs> Yeah, guy I was next minding to you. my own business, <laughs> and this, this trailer hit me. Yeah. Whose trailer was it? It was mine. <laughs> yeah. Dang it! Yeah. Well, it's always a little sad when we hit the end of the trail, but uh, there's always another trail ride just down the road. Uh, Jeep Talk Show has four episodes a week, Tuesday through Friday. Subscribe and never miss an episode. Hey, speaking of subscribing, consider keeping the Jeep Talk Show on the air by subscribing to the show via Patreon. The place to go for all the information on how to subscribe and how to contact us is at jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Uh, Chuck, thanks a lot for making time for us today. We uh, appreciate you being a guest host. And and I'll just mention this. I didn't mention mm -hmm. it earlier. Uh, Ch Chuck is being a guest host because the Internet connectivity out uh, uh, at his ranch is so bad. Uh, it's, it gives yeah. him such a delay while he's in a group. He's he's good in, in group conversations, and we'd love to have him there. Uh, but uh, it, the delay is so bad that... By the time he jumps in, we've already changed three subjects. So it's just frustrating yeah. for him. But when he's on here with just me, then you know, it's really easy for him to, to talk back and forth. Uh, probably not as, as easy as it would if I would shut up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I never, get to, I never get to talk about my Jeeps. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. I have a brand new Jeep we were going to talk about the CJ7. Me... That's this right. This is bullshit. Yeah. This is so much bullshit. It's nice. It's a, it's a pretty Jeep. <laughs> All right. Have a great night. Thank right, you. Don't, Thank don't you. Go to Discord. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Discord. Check out our Discord, jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to find out how to join. Chuck, thanks again, and uh, have a great day. Yeah. See ya. Broadcasting since 2010. You're my friend. You're my new friend. <laughs>